Well, it is Resurrection Sunday. So, as has already been pointed out, the Lord is alive and risen, and He lives forevermore. So, He's alive every day, but this is a, a good day to at least talk about something that has been a prominent uh, I don't think she can say a prominent theme, maybe the prominent theme of God's people all down through time. You can take the Bible and you can open it up to Genesis 1-1 and you can go all the way to Revelation 22-21 or whatever the last verse in the Bible is. It's something like that. And everything in between, it all talks about the resurrection. It's a it's something that we have to hope in. So this morning is going to be I don't I would kind of wrestled with this a few different ways to go about it because there's a lot of things to be taught about the resurrection. I'll probably say some things that are obvious and well known, and uh, hopefully everything else I say will just be out of the scripture because the resurrection should not be something new to teach about or talk about. There's been a lot of un- things about the resurrection that have interested uh, the people of God all down through time, uh, and there's been things that people of God and people of faith have thought and believed about the resurrection um, because we don't know everything. I know that's, that's a shock to our system when you come to that realization we don't know everything. Now, how many of you this morning believe in the resurrection of the dead? Okay. How many of you have seen a resurrection? <laughs> yeah. How many witnesses to the resurrection do we have in the room this morning? We haven't ever seen one, have we? It's going to be pretty wild. But we have some things in the earth that give us types. And the Lord even used something simple like a kernel of corn. How many of you have ever planted corn? When you put, look at the kernel, what does it look like? If you were to look at it and describe it, you would say, it's dead. I mean, if you just actually look at a kernel of corn before you plant it in the ground, you would look at it and think, there's no life there. It's dead. But somehow... When you plant it in the ground and you water it, you can get that if you need to. If it's important, you might need it before we get to the end. You know, if you look at that, you say, there's no life there. How many of you ever been to a funeral? You ever seen the, you ever do the casket? You walk by, you observe the body. What do you, how would you describe it? You'd look at it and you'd say, there's no life there. There's nothing there's nothing happening there in that body. It's just a body. It's, it's dead. But the Bible teaches that just as the kernel of corn goes into the ground and comes forth again, new life, that there will be a resurrection. The Lord tells us something very interesting as well in the book of Ezekiel. He says, all souls are mine. So that whole, it's your life, live how you please, turns out that's a lie too. The Bible says all souls are mine. Jesus taught of the resurrection that in the resurrection, some will come forth in the resurrection of the just. And he also taught of a resurrection of the wicked. There will be a resurrection. Every person who's lived on this earth is going to be resurrected. Now that's something we've never witnessed or seen. And for those who are in Christ, that's our hope. There's two important parts to the... I can't say there's... I I say that very matter-of-factly. I'm going to point out to you this morning two important parts of the gospel. They were touched on in Sunday school as well. One is receiving the word. The word has to be received in faith. Once it's received, 
we're left with a promise. And that promise is what gives us hope. It's that hope within us that we're told in the scripture, that hope within a man that purifies him. So we have a hope as children of God. And it's, we're talking about stuff we've never seen. We've never witnessed it. It's interesting, too, when you read the accounts in Scripture that, you know, the, the world and the people and men uh, of wicked hearts as they do, trying to prevent and secure their own hope, okay? Because let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Everyone in this earth has a hope of some kind. Is it not for hope that the Pharisees crucified our Lord? They had a hope as well. They had an expectation of a gain and an increase to themselves. So they crucified the Lord in hope. And then they sent a watch to secure the tomb in hope. So these men had a hope as well, but it was not a lively hope. The Bible says that the hope and expectation of the wicked will be cut off. And there's a reason for that, and it's because God is true. And I'm going somewhere with this. Just walk with me a few paces as, as we get there. The expectation of the wicked is cut off because there's some things God has already decreed. So these men sent these to the tomb to safeguard the tomb against uh, perhaps, as they feared, the disciples stealing his body away, claiming that he was resurrected. Oh, no, it was much bigger than that. That's what they were afraid of. More to their horror than anything, probably, was this, that Christ spoke the truth. And all the men, think about this. This is remarkable. The very men that were sent by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the religious leaders, the very men they sent to perform their will and secure the tomb, became eyewitnesses to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now only God can work that way. Right. He took the men that were to be the insurance that the will of the Pharisees be done, and he took those men and he made them eyewitnesses to the resurrection of the living Savior. You may not know it yet, but God can change people's minds. And he can change people's hearts. I want you to turn, if you would, to the book of John, chapter number 11. There was a lot of things going through my mind uh, about the resurrection. It's such a powerful hope that we have in Christ. And it's such a lively thing, and it's such, it encompasses such a large aspect of all Scripture that to try to whittle it down and decide what to preach on this morning, like the uh, Brother Barry said, we kind of know when the resurrection happened and the crucifixion, the birth, not so much, but we know about the resurrection. And so on this morning, as we're thinking about that and more cognizant of that, what to preach and what to think about, and I almost came nearly to a loss, a really, there's so much. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's everything we hope for, is it not? Yeah. I mean, we have, uh, the Bible says we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this present evil world that we see, we've escaped by faith in Christ Jesus because he overcame death and the grave. And you go to the, go to the very beginning with Eve, and it was foretold of her seed that would bruise the serpent's head. Only women don't have seed, do they? Interesting. It's always the men. But then you get to Abraham, and there was a promised seed to Abraham. And that's who we're told by Paul in the book of Hebrews, Christ was the promised seed of Abraham that was to come, made of a woman in the likeness of flesh, but sinless, perfect, and hated by the world, who came for the express purpose of offering himself a sacrifice, just like was promised and foretold to Abraham. 
when he was taking Isaac to the altar to sacrifice his son. And he told his son, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's exactly what God did. And so now we, who by faith have been made one with Christ, are of that seed of Abraham. Because we're in Christ. We're not some separate seed. We've been brought into Christ. And now being in Christ, we are of the promised seed of Abraham. Because Christ is that promised seed. And we have entered into him by faith. And the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God by adoption. Okay. So here we come to this idea of resurrection. This should be the present living hope of every Christian. It's not to save the United States of America. It's not to preserve our political identities. It's not, it's not to establish some kingdom on this earth today. It's to escape it. Because there's something better coming. And when we stand before God in the resurrection... We trust by faith that having been made uh, clean from our sins and been granted forgiveness for Christ's sake, not for our own sake, but been granted forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake because of what he did for us. We, by faith accepting him, turning in repentance to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, been made partakers of the divine nature are now, at this present time, alive unto God. At this present time. That means we've already been born again spiritually, and that after death will be a continuance of life, because we're in Christ. And that old man is dead. I love how Paul puts it. He says... But ye are dead, <laughs> right? That old man died. Christ crucified on the cross. That's that old man, that old nature, put to death. And now we have entered by faith into Christ and are alive unto God. So when we talk about the resurrection, it should be the present living hope of every believer that we have turned from the things of this world all the, all the pleasures, all the desires, all the allures, all the things that would draw us aside and distract us, giving us some promise of things in this life. We've abandoned all hope in those, and we've turned only to Christ. We've turned only to Christ and put our hope and our confidence and our faith in Him. And now, at this time, we are waiting for His return. That's it. We are occupying the earth, preaching the gospel, awaiting the return of our Lord. That should be the preeminent thought in the lives of every Christian as we walk the earth today. We're, just, we're occupying. We're pilgrims and strangers. We're passing through. We're waiting. All through the New Testament, you see the saints of God awaiting his return. Looking. Watchful just like Christ commanded that we should be. Well, we're going to go a couple different places, but I want to start here in John chapter number 11. We can all stand and we'll read just a few scriptures. In verse number 11, says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. 
Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning as those gathered out of the world and assembled in your name here this morning to hear from your spirit and from your word. We're thankful to you for your son, Jesus Christ for the debt that he paid for us on the cross, for the power of his resurrection, and for the hope that we have as we await his return, Father. And we pray that during that time you would teach us that we might increase in knowledge and in faith and in grace, that we might be useful in your service in all things as we seek to be a witness to the lost. Lord, we confess that of ourselves, uh, we don't know how to do that very well. We don't know how to Uh, to spread the gospel very well. We don't know how to teach the gospel very well at times. We don't know how to represent uh, your son, Jesus Christ, to the people in the earth today, Lord, that are in need of a Savior. But we pray that you might teach us and instruct us as we seek to be obedient to that call and that the hope of the resurrection that is in us, that we might be able to share that with others, Lord, that they also might escape. Lord, that's our hope and that's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I asked you this morning, how many of you have witnessed deaths? I've never been present when someone has died, so I don't know what that experience is like. I've I've been close uh, within a few hours uh, of people passing. And we know uh, that that's a bit of a process. We don't even really know how that happens or what it looks like. But we've all witnessed death. And so when we preach about death, there's not a lot of convincing necessary. It's just necessary and needful for people to understand two things. Why it happens and that it is going to happen to you. Those two things are important. So it's amazing, is it not, that even though we live with death all the time, it's hard in this world to get people to even consider that. It's hard to get people to think about the fact that, one, death happens because of sin. And when if you are a sinner, the Bible tells us that we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So the scripture and God by the scripture has concluded all men under sin and all men are going to die. And that's a promise. Now we hope to be of that small remnant, right? That's on the earth at the return of the Lord. And we hope, and I think there was a lot of people in the New Testament that had the same hope that they would see Christ return. Man, I hope to see that. I would love to be alive on the earth when that happens. Is that a promise? No. That's a pretty slim chance, given the gravity of human history. We see that that's not for us to decide. Christ's only command was to be watchful. To be watchful. Do you know that he taught his disciples while he was on the earth to watch for his coming? He taught them that while he was here. Why? Because they're going to need that. One... Because you must have that hope alive in you by the Spirit of God. You must have it. If you don't have that hope alive in you, it will be all too easy to get swept away with the things of this world. All too easy to get entangled and ensnared in all the other busyness and transactions that happen on a day-to-day basis on this earth. But we have been given a hope. I want you to notice something. I only picked this passage for one reason, and then we're actually going to go to the book of Matthew. There's one thing that I want to say out of this passage, and that's it. Just one. And I might even just, we might just give the invitation and be done right there. I don't know. There's one, there's important 
principle for you to understand about what Jesus is talking about here as it pertains to death. Now, this is not, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but everyone in this room, you need to understand death is promised to you. It's a promise of God. You know, I was reading in the book of Matthew with a promise uh, that was written in the word of God. And Jesus Christ said this night to his apostles, he said, this night shall ye all be offended of me. And Peter said, I will never be offended. But Jesus Christ told them that it would happen because why? He said, for it is written. Listen, there's not a chance for you. There is not a chance for you to escape what God has decreed. And Peter really believed in himself he would never do that. But the word of God had concluded already what would happen. And that though scripture might be fulfilled, it played out exactly like God had said in his word. And so when God tells them, because it's written and it's going to happen, how do you prepare for that? The point was that after it happened, he could believe. Because everything that has been written is going to be fulfilled exactly as God has promised. That's an important element. When we talk about the resurrection and the hope we have in Christ, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that we know and have confidence because of everything. Like I said, nobody in here has even seen a resurrection. And if we saw one, we'd probably need a resurrection because we'd probably fall over dead right there. I'm pretty sure of it. If you saw a resurrection happen, you'd probably need resuscitation of some kind. That's why, because that's backwards to our way of thinking. People grow old and die and they're gone. They don't grow old, die, and come back. But the Lord has promised Listen with your spiritual ears. God has promised that he's going to do something in this earth the likes of which has never been seen. I mean, you're talking the power of God. We talked a little bit about the power of God to forgive sins a couple weeks ago. Now, when when, when Jesus Christ forgave sins, nobody saw the power. They didn't see anything happen. You couldn't observe it. And so we think, well, that's not much to that, is there? Listen, there's power in the Word of God. You're going to see power revealed on this earth like you've never seen. I mean, I'm pretty excited about it. It's unbelievable to think about the resurrection, just to take some time. One, to give thanks to God that He has made possible everlasting life. Knowing how wicked we are and what we deserve at his hand, that Christ bore that in himself, and now he comes and makes this statement. Listen to this. He says in verse number 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Now notice what Martha was doing. Martha was doing what any good Christian would do. You're trying to draw in a time of difficulty and grief. And I hope this is what you do in your life. In a time of difficulty and grief and affliction, you draw from what you know about God's word that's true. It's not a lot sometimes, but that's the only hope we really have, isn't it? Because as we're told in the book of Ephesians, the truth is in Jesus. Everybody nowadays wants the truth. It's in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. You're not going to find it. Jesus Christ will give you the truth. And so we draw from that. And so she's, she's grasping at what she knows. And in this time of difficulty and grief, she says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Look, there's a resurrection coming at the last day. Now, there's a lot of opinions about that last day and everything that's going on. But we know that the resurrection of the just happens before the thousand-year reign of Christ. And that that last day, that's what we're talking about. The resurrection of the just. Before the last day, to live and to reign with Christ on the earth. 
So we're talking about what she knew about the resurrection because that had been foretold. You go back to the time of Job, the earliest scriptures that we have written. And Job talked about the resurrection. All through the Bible you find the hope of God's people in next, the next life, the eternal inheritance that's promised, the resurrection in the life to come. And we find when we come to this place that Martha's conversing with Christ about this knowledge she has of the resurrection. And he tells her that something that I think we miss to a certain degree when he confesses to her the truth in verse number 25, and he says, I am the resurrection. How many times, and this is so, it's easy for us to do, and I've, I struggle with this myself because a lot of people have read a lot of scripture for a long time, and we all apply ourselves to it to know it, to understand it. But until Jesus Christ opens it to you, it's very difficult to know. And sometimes you're only given what you need to know when you need to know. But how many times have we talked about the resurrection, and in a certain context it's true and it's right, but we talk about it like an event. We say the resurrection, like an event. Jesus Christ here turns that thinking on Martha's part just a little bit, and he says, look, you're waiting for an event, but I'm telling you the truth. I am the resurrection. He was standing right there in front of her. And he says the event, resurrection is not coming someday, an event on the earth. Yes, it's going to happen at a point in time when the fullness of time has come and the Father says, okay, it's time, that event's going to happen. But Jesus tells her the resurrection is not just an event that's going to happen someday. It's in me. I am the resurrection. What you're looking for is not a hope to come in an event someday, but the hope that is in me. Because he says, I am the life. Book of Ezekiel, all souls are mine. Do you believe that? Do you believe your soul, it is not yours? When we're talking about the resurrection, we're talking about a lot of interesting things that you can talk about and discuss uh, and, and find a lot of interesting uh, doctrine and stuff that just brings joy to my heart, but you're talking about what? This tabernacle, this, this tabernacle that we inhabit. We see that Jesus Christ came to the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came and fashioned as a man. What did he have? He had that temple that was talked about all the way back in King Nebuchadnezzar's vision that was the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, the te temple of God made without hands, the body of Jesus Christ walking the earth, died on the cross, and by the power of God was brought back to life. That physical body, gloriously changed into something we don't understand or know yet, being the first fruits unto God. So too is our hope. We are, Isaac Farnsworth is, I've, I've been clothed upon with this creature, this tabernacle that the Bible says is the temple of the living God. And I've been given this, this tabernacle to dwell in for a time, knowing that the same God who has subjected this creature to vanity for a time to be exercised in labor and in travail and in sorrow and in affliction and in anything else that he deems worthy to send my way, that this tabernacle that I dwell in, that may suffer all of those things and has been subjected to vanity, has been subjected by the same God to hope. That I might learn by experience that the things of this life are not going to fulfill. They're not going to satisfy. They're not going to last. They're not eternal. They're nothing to be hoped for. They're nothing to be longed after. They're nothing to set your heart upon. But the God who has given all these has subjected us to vanity for a time that we as children might learn until the time when the fullness of our redemption is complete and we are resurrected 
receiving our new body and our eternal inheritance. Martha didn't know all that. She didn't have the benefit that we have with the scriptures we have and, and what we know to be true in the risen Savior. But Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Simple. Born again, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Not of corruptible seed, as Peter talks about, but incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth ever. We have received the word of God into our hearts. You go to the book of Acts. Then they that receive the word gladly. That's all that's required. Jesus Christ has accomplished everything else. The only thing required of us Gentiles that have been grafted in is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And people won't. Why? Because of the deceitfulness of this present world. This present evil world, the Bible calls it, that keeps us focused on the flesh and all of its empty promises, empty living, and things that will never satisfy. They won't. You look at the, um, the woman who Jesus was talking to by the well. He promised her living water. Never thirst again, he told her. And then he told her to go call her husband. I'm talking about this with somebody the other day. So he tells her, go and uh, call your husband. What did he, she say? Oh, I don't have a husband. And the Lord said, that's right. You've actually had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What was he showing her? Look, you've been searching. You've been looking all through life for something that will fulfill you and satisfy. The fact that you've been married five times proves that. And you're not able to find it. You can't find the satisfaction that the things of this life promise to have. But it never pans out the way that the world promises that it will. All of the sin in this world, this pleasure for a season, of young people, listen up. Old people, pay attention too. Listen, young people. The world is going to throw a lot of stuff your way with a lot of promises about how it's going to turn out yeah. their lives. Amen. I don't know how else to put it to you, but you can buy into that stuff, and it, won't, it will not manifest itself immediately. If it did, you'd run from it as fast as you could. No, no, no. It's very subtle. But it may be decades go by, and all of a sudden you turn around, and you're looking at a path of carnage and havoc that's been wreaked in your life, because you turned your back on God looking for the things of this world. How much better to commit yourself to Christ, to live for him, and to allow him to bring into your life those blessings that are most suitable for you. I've known young ladies who travel around church to church looking for husbands. Honor God, honor his institution of the church, and trust him that he will bring the right man to your life. But you put the husband first and you start searching for one and abandon your faith and your faithfulness to go find a husband, it's not going to pan out well for you because we've gotten the priorities out of order. In all thy ways acknowledge him Amen. and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. He will do it. That's called faith. And all of those things in life can't measure up to the hope we have in Christ in the life that is to come. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection. Not just an event that's going to happen someday. Turn, if you would, to the book of Matthew. I don't tempted to read quite a bit here. There's nothing better for us, just so we can all agree publicly. There's nothing better for us 
than the word of God. Amen. So we may do some reading here. I think it's good. Um, we're going to begin reading in Matthew chapter number 27. And I love the testimony of scripture that tells us, whom having not seen, ye love. Because that is, that's the truth about Jesus Christ. We receive the record and the testimony. Like I said, those people that were there to ensure the will of the Pharisees that became the eyewitnesses that came back to the Pharisees and said, uh, he's gone because this angel appeared, uh, had a countenance like lightning, we all hit the earth like dead men, and next thing we knew, he's gone. Oops. They, they literally became the witnesses to the truth. And so you look at all these things and how it unfolds and the record that has been preserved. And it, just like Jesus told Thomas, what did he tell Thomas? You know, you have seen and believed, blessed are they. I like to think the Lord was talking about me right there. Amen. Because he says, blessed are they who having not seen have believed. We've never seen. I believe. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. I believe his word. Receiving the record and the testimony of what he did on the cross. The power of the resurrection. You know, we talk about the gospel. What do we say the gospel is? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ according to the scriptures. And I like to add, and his promised return. That is what we look for. We look for his return. That's what we're waiting for. That's the only thing holding us back in this life is being a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ to others and waiting for his return. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, is the prayer, right? We're looking for it. We're expecting it. It could happen. I expect it to happen. It's going to happen. You know why? Because it was written. It was written, just like Peter. It doesn't matter what Peter thought about how he would react. It was already written that Christ would be forsaken, and he was forsaken. And we find also that he has promised that he's coming again. When the morning was come, in verse number 1 of chapter 27, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Still happening today. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now listen, this is a remarkable scene for those who can see it with the eyes of faith. Who was it that had brought Pontius Pilate to power? We know it's the hand of God who raises up men and he puts down men. There's not a person on this earth that can set their mind to be born into a situation that's going to afford them whatever opportunity is to be. I know that the world tells us you can be whatever you want to be. There's something to be said for hard work, but God raises up kings, and he puts down kings. And here Pontius Pilate's on the throne. Now picture Jesus Christ, if you have Pontius Pilate on the throne, and the, the Roman uh, judgment seats of that time were usually up several steps, kind of a big throne-like appearance. And here you have Pontius Pilate sitting on this big judgment seat, the irony. Oh my goodness. When you picture Pontius Pilate sitting on the judgment seat and Christ at his feet. And Christ trusting the Father and knowing his will submitted himself to the authority that God had put there. I don't care what your opinion is about gun rights. This is the example. And he had already told Peter, whosoever takes up the sword is going to die with the sword. Put your sword in his place. And so here he comes, and Pilate's sitting there in the seat of judgment, and Christ is at his feet. And this is the scene. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. In other words, he changed his mind. He changed his mind. There's not always, there's not always a good way out. 
after you have ignored the truth. Because this is the lesson. It, if it's not for the Spirit of God working in us to preserve us, we don't know how to save ourselves. So Judas can repent himself and change his mind. But where is he going to turn? He's already betrayed the Christ. He turns to himself, and now he's trying to find a way out. And there is no way out. Apart from Christ, there's no other way. There's nowhere else to turn. And so this is the state of men all over the earth. And the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is the ways of death. You can't find it on your own. Here he repents himself, changes his mind when he saw that Christ was condemned. And he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. The religious leaders. Very concerned for this man's soul at this time. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. No hope. He had hoped a lot of things. I, I believe we can surmise. We don't really know. But he betrayed the Christ for the riches of this world. You need to take note of that. Because Christ had taught his apostles, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the things of this world and this life. Because they're at enmity one to the other. And you'll either love the one and hate the other or cleave to the one and hate the other. But you can't do both. Judas tried to prove him wrong, but it had already been written. And it had already been said and it's already done. It's the word of God. You can't do both. Judas, Judas thought, hey, I can make some money. Christ has the power to get away anyway if he wants to. And then he saw that he was taken. And he didn't resist. And he was condemned. Quite a place to find yourself as a man when you realize too late that you should have listened to Christ. And he didn't end up with the silver or gold. Lots of good teaching there, too. And the chief priests took the silver pieces, and they said, what? Well, they were always concerned with what's lawful. And they said, it's not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. No, it's, it's lawful somehow to pay for the price of blood, but it's not lawful to receive the money back that you gave, and you said it's the price of blood. You're the one who paid it. It's your money. Oh, we got to do what's lawful. Got to do what's right. And they took counsel. It's the second time we see them taking counsel. And bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. It had already been written. It had already been foretold. And if Judas had known his Bible, about the time they offered him 30 pieces of silver as a covenant, he would have turned and fled for his life. But he didn't know the scriptures, and he didn't know the power of God. And he took the money and became the fulfillment of, of that which was spoken by Jeremiah. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, and so much that the governor marveled greatly. The Bible still says that we will give an account for every idle word spoken. And it still says that out of our own mouths we will be judged. And here these men railing on Christ, bearing false witness against Christ, all for envy's sake. And he never answered a word. Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had... Then a notable prisoner were called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye 
that I release unto you Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So we have going forth from there the mocking, the scourging, the beating of Christ, the scorning him, the laughter. Everyone using the strength that God had given them to smite the one by whom it was given. And making light of Christ. And what's, what's most remarkable is not how people behave. Because that's typical. I mean, what the people did is what people do. I'm not surprised at all when we read the account of how people behaved. That that much anger was poured out on Christ through them. Because that's, that's what we are as people. I mean, that's who we are. We, we're angry. We're frustrated, we're uh, difficult, disobedient, right? I mean, that's what people, what's remarkable is not all that, because you can read that and you say, yeah, it sounds like mankind in general. But what's remarkable is as Christ, being who he was, having the power he had, suffered it to be so. Listen, faith is the principal thing for you and I in our time. Faith towards God, not fighting our own battles, not being the revenger of ourselves, not going out and doing a battle for our own reputation and for our own uh, desires and for all the things that we see and think should be done or ought to be. That's not it. Take from Christ's example. I mean, I love what David said when, was it Cushai? Uh, that was throwing stones at him and cursing him. And, and the guy, David's servant says, do you want me to go take his head off? Because I can't. And I'll, go do, I'll be happy because he's kind of obnoxious. He's frustrating me too. All I need is the king to say yes. I mean, sometimes we get that way, right? I know I need the authority to go do what I want. But if you give me the authority, I'd be happy to go take his head off. And David said, no. He said, it, it may be that God hath told him to go curse David and David said, it may be that God will look upon mine affliction and have mercy on me. Man, what an attitude to have. I, I want to have more of that. Whatever that is, that faith to believe that what is happening in my life is ordained of God and not to strive against it, that's what I want. I want to trust God with my life. If it means suffering affliction, if it means... Uh, anything that may come, if it means uh, difficulties I wouldn't choose for myself, and to receive it with thanksgiving, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That is faith. What an example of Christ. So we go through all this. We see uh, the everything going on, the mock trial that took place, uh, and the whole trial was a, a sham of justice anyway. It was all uh, driven by their agenda and what they wanted the outcome to be. Uh, and they're still dancing this weird line between trying to get uh, the crucifixion and a trial done before the holy day because they didn't want to profane the law and they wanted to observe all their ordinances and things. Uh, so there's this weird thing going on with all of man's ordinances and here they're crucifying the Son of God who they knew to be innocent of no, of no crime. They tried to make him guilty, finally found uh, him guilty of blasphemy because he 
claim to be the Son of God. Regardless of the fact that every evidence had been set forth that he was the Son of God. Healing leprosy, restoring sight to the blind, raising the dead. Has this stuff heard of in the earth? By what power a man can do those things? Every evidence evidently set forth. Fulfillment of every scripture. So here we have all this and then the burial. After he had cried out and you can go through all the things he said on the cross. And at the very end he says, my father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That's how I want to leave this earth. No hope in myself at all. There's not a hope I have that I can hang on anything within myself other than the hope I have in Christ. That's it. I know what I am, and it's pretty bad. Pretty wicked individual, that old Isaac Farnsworth. Not a good guy. But praise God, through Jesus Christ, I have a hope. I have a hope of a resurrection and forgiveness of sins has been granted to me. And that hope is living within me and I'm waiting for the return of Christ. There's no other hope on this earth I have that could persuade me to abandon the hope I have in Christ and the things that he will bring with him when he comes in the glory that is his alone. Looking forward to that day. So in verse number 66 of chapter number 27, after they were given a watch, we'll begin concluding here. In verse number 66, it says, So they went and made the sepulcher sure. And to that we say, sure. Probably where we get the saying, sure. They made it sure, as sure as they could. They did everything humanly possible to ensure that Christ was taken away, not knowing all along it was the plan of God. Christ even said, it's for this reason I came into the world. He didn't seek to hide himself from it. And I ask you, do you know the cause for which you have been brought into the world? Do we know the purpose for which we've been brought into the world? And do we spend time trying to hide ourselves from the purpose of God for us? Christ didn't. He submitted himself and subjected himself to every scoffer, every scorner, every torment, every affliction. And he did it knowing it was the will of the Father. Set himself forward as that example. So they made it sure, they sealed the stone, and they set a watch. Done. As far as they were concerned, and you, you try to look at this in the, in, the, in the eyes of the people that were there at the time. And do you do realize, I hope everyone in this room realizes, at this moment in time, the things that are going on and moving and happening both in earth and in heaven. I mean, the Bible has told us that in Jesus Christ, the Father has seen fit to reconcile in him and to make of one all things, both which are in heaven and in earth. In other words, it's Jesus Christ that's the fulfillment of the type that was given when God made Adam and put all the works of his hands in subjection to Adam and gave him dominion. Adam was a type of that, but Christ being the true one that has come, that all the works of God, both in heaven and in earth, are going to be brought under his dominion. And he is now sitting at the right hand of God, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And we know that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's weird. Death is going to die. Who would have thought of that? It's God's plan. Death is going to die. And there's not going to be any more death. Only life. So they made it sure. They set a watch. And in verse number 1 of chapter 28, as history is in the balance right here. Okay, all the adversaries in heaven... Whether you're talking about principalities and powers and the, the armies of Satan and all of his forces and they're competing against God and his will and his son and his savior and the Messiah 
and he's hung there on the cross, and all of these forces are clashing, both in the earth, and we see it playing out in the earth, in the attitudes and the faces and the countenance of the multitude set against Christ, though represented the powers of Satan and his armies and everything that they could bring to bear to come against Christ with his armies. And here he is hanging on the cross, and they are tasting victory. They are seeing that their side is winning. They have a hope that they're going to be able to pull this off. But their hope is soon cut very short. Because Christ had even said that this is their hour. It's the hour of darkness. It had already been given over to them just to prove their wickedness. If God turned things over for one hour, what's going to happen? It happened on Calvary. That's what will happen because the wickedness of man is great. And he turned, his, he turned it over. It's the hour of darkness. And whatever restraining force of the Spirit steps out of the way, and man has his way with the Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Promised One, the Holy One, the Just One, the Anointed One of God, and they had their way with him, and they put him to death on the cross. And there he hung, and there's a few good men that desired to take him down, to give him a burial, and they put him in a tomb, and now everything is silent. Day goes by. Two days go by. Silence. What's happening? What's happening in the earth? What's happening in those spiritual places that we can't see. Morning is coming. That's what's happening. There's a day coming on this earth when it is going to be turned over to the power of darkness. And we see the mystery of iniquity that's already at work and we see things going that way. It's coming. It's going to be turned over to them. And there's going to be a lot of things happening in the earth that we would look and say, why is that being allowed to happen? It's a day of temptation and trial on the earth. But that doesn't shake those who have their hope in Christ. Because the day of Christ, for those of us who are of the day and not of the night, it's not going to overtake us as a thief in the night. Because we're watching, we're expecting, we're living in hope of the return of our Savior. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. These were some of the mightiest, these were military soldiers. Military men. Trained. They had seen a lot in their time of service, I'm sure. If you read some of the histories of what was going on on the earth during the time of Jesus, it wasn't a real peaceful place. Lots of fighting, lots of war, back and forth. Romans, not really great people. Kind of iron-fisted folk who wanted to do things their way. And this is what was going on in the earth. These men fell down as dead because for once in their life, for once in their life, and I pray that this happens for every person in this room before they meet God, that once in their life, they will get a glimpse of reality. That's it. That's all it takes just a glimpse of reality. Oh, we live in such a deceived, weird, topsy-turvy world. But these men, for a moment, they saw reality. They realized that there are other beings that God has made that are mightier than mankind. If you could just get mankind to admit that, it would be going a long way in the right direction. To not live as if we have all the authority and all the power to do as we please. But that is the heart of a wicked man. 
to think I will live as I choose to live because I have the power to do so. And who's going to restrain me or hold me back from doing as I please? These men finally got an answer to that question. Whenever they saw the angel of the Lord, they fell down as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, God knows, it's the, I, I just testify to you the truth of what God says in his word, because it's going to come to pass. <laughs> Everything he said, he says he knows them that are his. You'll notice the angel addresses those that are God's children. Amen. Those little sheep, he came. All the men are laying on the ground like dead men, scared for their lives and just fell over dead. Just terrified, shock. And here stand these women as they come. And the angel, because he has the power to do so, he appeared to them comfortably. Not that they still weren't scared, but he didn't present himself to them the same way he presented himself to those other men. And that's a difference, isn't it? And so here he comes. Notice what he tells the women. He says unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Wow. Even though they didn't understand. They didn't know all these things. Isn't it amazing that Christ, I forget which of the gospels it's in, but it, all the time he spent telling his disciples, I'm going to die. It's necessary. The Son of Man must be sacrificed. Where I'm going, you can't come. I'm going to be crucified. The Son of Man must be lifted up. And he was teaching them this. And teaching them that he would rise again the third day. And here when it happens, they can't believe. They didn't understand. And actually in one of the Gospels it says, I think it's in John, that it says, for they knew not yet the scriptures that he must rise again. The, he had been teaching them, but it didn't, the Spirit hadn't brought all that together. But you're living it. Listen, they've had three and a half years. These men have left their businesses. They've left their families. They've forsaken everything. And they've followed this man, Jesus, and now he's dead. And what are they to do? And now days are passing. And now all of a sudden, here comes a whisper and a, and a, a rumor. Oh, he's been seen. Oh, he's not in the tomb. Oh, he's appeared unto Mary Magdalene. Oh, he's appeared under Simon. And people are beginning to see this man that had been crucified and put to death. And this begins to grow. And people are not sure what to think. And we know that the group of the apostles in the uh, uh, Gospel of Mark were told that when the Lord finally appeared to them as a group, he upbraided them for their unbelief. Because they couldn't believe it was true. And so it is true. There was a great earthquake, and when the stone was rolled back, the only thing everyone noticed was, he's gone. He's gone. Where is he? That's been a subject of much study and debate. He's everywhere. Just bank on that. He's everywhere. We're told all through the New Testament. We're, we're gathered together in his name. There is he. He's here this morning. He's living in the hearts of each and every one of his children. He has taken up residence in their heart for those who have repented and come to him by faith, believing only that what he said is true Amen. because the testimony of Scripture cannot be broken. And everything that he testified is true. It all came true. And now we find that there are still yet. And we're going to finish right here. I'm going to wrap up. In John chapter number, is it seven? It's not seven. It's further than that. I want to say it's, maybe it's 13. Ah, oh, 14, here it is. John chapter number 14, verse number three. So we see that salvation is, it's the most simply you can put it is this. It's believing the testimony of the word of God. Believe it. That Jesus Christ died on the cross because we 
can't save ourselves. Amen. In fact, we can't even do one good thing. Amen. Stop and muse on that for a while. The Bible says you can't do. <laughs> In other words, listen, mankind, if you decided, I'm going to go do something good, and you actually set your mind and said, I want to go do a good thing. You're going to go out and do something. Did you know that the Bible says you can't? You can only be a sinner. And that's why we needed a Savior. But he loved us, and he did it for us. We don't have to be, we don't have to conform to the law. Christ did. The, the law is there to show you how wicked you are. Book of 1 Timothy. We know the law is good if a man use it lawfully because the law is for murderers and sorcerers and seditioners and adulterers and heresies and all the other things that he lists. That's who the law is for. And so we were also among these in time past when we had our conversation among the Gentiles according to the foolishness of our flesh and the lusts that work in us. But now, being dead to those things and alive unto God, we don't live according to the flesh. We live by the Spirit. And so being of the Spirit, we have a hope of life. And here we have this promise because this is what we hang our hat on, I guess you could say. I mean, it is, it is the promise of Jesus Christ, and there's a lot of other places in Scripture you can go, but I chose this one because it's interesting. He's talking to his disciples while he's here on the earth, and he's talking about some of the things that are going to be happening. And he says in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. How many of you have ever had your heart troubled about something? Sure. Jesus Christ is giving us a hope. He's saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Why? Because everything he said is the truth. Amen. He is the only one that dwells in the light that no man can approach unto. He only has seen the Father and has testified to us of the Father. We can't approach unto the Father. We can't go to the Father. We can't dwell in that light. But Christ does, and he has shared with us this knowledge. And he has given to us this faith. That if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen. I will come again. Now notice what he's talking about because he says, and receive you unto myself. So we know he's not just talking about his resurrection. We know he's not just talking about the appearances that he made to his disciples after the, the 40 days immediately following his resurrection and before his ascension. Because he didn't come and receive them unto himself, he went and left them here. And this is what he's talking about. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now listen, this is one thing for us to know that Christ is where we are. But it is another hope altogether to have a hope of being where he is. Amen. That is the hope we have. That is the hope of the resurrection. That is the power of God towards those that fear him and love his name. Is that he will come again, receive us unto himself, and take us to be where he is. Not just that he'll be with us where we are. And I praise God for that promise. And it's, good, it's a lively hope that will keep us hoping until the day when the, the glory of the sons of God will be revealed, as we're told. We haven't seen that day yet. It's going to be a day to be much remembered. <laughs> I promise you that. It's going to be a day to be much remembered. It's going to be a lot more exciting than this morning. <laughs> David, you're going to be full of so much joy and energy and gladness. Can you believe that? The good gifts of God that he has in store for his children. It won't be like this morning. It won't be anything like it. This morning we're wrapped in the flesh. We're encompassed with sin and infirmity and affliction in our bodies. Our minds are plagued with uh, corruption. 
We're here on the earth. We're limited for time. Your belly's getting hungry. Your mind's growing weary and tired of listening to preaching. It won't be like this day. It'll be a day far different, much better, when the power and the glory of God is revealed from heaven, and this is our hope. If you believe that Christ is true, this is our hope. If your hope is not in an event, but it's bound up in the person of Jesus Christ, knowing that he is the truth. If your hope is bound up, if your, if your hope is bound up in an event, then the delayed and prolonged process of getting there can be discouraging, can it? I mean, have you ever looked forward to something? It's like Christmas when you're about six, maybe seven. It's looking forward to Christmas is just agonizing because it's so far away and it's never going to get here. Well, as children of God, our hope isn't in the event because that would be discouraging, wouldn't it? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And we're told by Peter, I believe it's Peter, that we should account that the long-suffering of God, in other words, the tarrying period, is salvation. In other words, there's hope in that as well. What of your neighbors and your loved ones and those that don't know Christ and haven't put their faith in him? This time is a chime of hope for them before the master of the house rises and shuts the door. And the hope of the wicked will be cut off. There's no more hope. Only for those who are hoping in Christ. Man, the resurrection. I don't know if I can say anything this morning. I feel regularly the affliction you're under to have me as your minister. <laughs> because I'm trying to serve you the word of God, knowing the truth and the fullness and the power of it. But can I actually tell you something about the resurrection? You just have to believe it. We've never seen it. But I count that God is faithful who has promised. And I've seen everything in his word that he said be fulfilled exactly like he said it would. And the resurrection will be no different. It's going to happen on a day. And it's going to be glorious. And it will show the power of God. And it will show the goodness and the grace of God that he has towards those who love him and fear his name and have put their faith in his son. Amen. Brother Adam, you come, we'll have a verse of invitation. Maybe you need a hope this morning other than the hope that the world offers you. Maybe you need a hope.